You know, one of the key things that we see in the truth of God's word is how we are saved. We are saved by grace through faith. So if you're the devil, one of the things you're going to want to touch is those two key concepts. If you can mar our understanding of grace and mar our understanding of faith, what have you done? You've completely uprooted and undermined how we are saved. And now the Christian actually doesn't even know how he is saved because his idea of grace is messed up and his idea of faith is messed up. It's a brilliant tactic. And that's exactly what we see the enemy doing in our modern generation. So if you start with the concept of grace, grace oftentimes today is understood as just a hug of God. Here we are just a mess, which is definitely true. We are a mess. And so God comes along and he says, you know what? I know you're a mess, but I love you as a mess. And so he gives us a big hug. And you know, he doesn't intend to change us from being a mess. In fact, he loves us being a mess. And that's called grace, God loving the mess. Well, that's actually not what grace is in the Bible. You could call it more kindness, long suffering, mercy, but God loves us too much to leave us a mess. You see, maybe he loves us while we were yet sinners and that's when he died for us and he expressed and shed abroad that love. However, he does not love us in that state or to keep us in that state, he loves us to help us out of that state. His agenda with us is to establish our feet upon a rock, to wash us clean, and to imbue his power or his life into us to enable us to live out a life that otherwise would be impossible. Well, that's called grace. You see, it's grace that rescues us in our weakened state. And grace does have attributes of kindness and mercy and long suffering. That's part of grace, but grace is a lot bigger than that. Those words already exist in the Bible. Mercy, you don't need to mix up grace and mercy. It's a separate concept. Grace is a work. It is an enabling power of God to accomplish something in our lives. And so what we see in our modern day is we see the concept of grace being turned into a license to remain in sin, a license to remain in the pigsty. It's like, no, God loves me in the pigsty. That's actually what we see in Jude 1 verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. Well, what did these ungodly men do? It says that they turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness, a license to sin. It's like, no, we have legal right to this. We're under grace. They transformed grace into something that it isn't. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. When you turn the grace of God into a license to sin, it's an affront to the cross. It's an affront to Jesus Christ. Grace was never given as an excuse for sin. It was given as a means to have dominion over sin. And so I think we've got to get back to the intention. You know, I think I put in one of my books, uh, the, the whole welfare system in America was designed to help needy families. Couldn't provide for their uh, children and so on and so forth. And so there were food stamps and so on. The problem was they abused the intent of that and went out and used food stamps for alcohol, traded it in for drugs and everything else. That was an abuse of the intention. And, and so I think we've got to go back to the original intention of grace to understand that, that there is an abuse of grace that is not acceptable. Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. What is this great thing called grace that came through Jesus? A basic definition of grace is undeserved or unmerited favor. Grace always flows down. The slave doesn't show grace to his Lord, but rather the Lord to his slave. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But a grace without truth is not biblical grace. Any grace beyond biblical grace is false and dangerous. Grace is so much more than unmerited favor. In His grace, God exerts His holy influence upon souls. With those who abide in Christ, grace teaches them, grace empowers them, and grace kindles them to the exercise of Christian virtue, righteousness, and holiness. When I speak of hyper-grace, what am I speaking of? I'm speaking of a message that basically says this. Because Jesus has died for us and made us righteous, and we are now fully accepted in Jesus, that not only have we already been justified so that God puts us in the righteous column, 
not only have we already been justified, but we have already been sanctified and made perfectly holy in God's sight. So God only sees us as holy. It's not even that He sees us through His Son, but He sees us as holy. He doesn't see our sins. And because Jesus died for all of our sins, past, present, and future, that means that all of your sins have already been considered forgiven by God. God's already forgiven your future sins, therefore you never need to confess sin because it's already forgiven and doesn't exist in God's sight. You never need to repent of sin because it's already been forgiven and doesn't exist in God's sight. And any human effort that you put into trying to please God is a denial of grace and a denial of the cross. In the New Testament, we see grace, the word translated around 126 times, I should say around it, I think it is 126 times. Out of those 126 times, I think it's around 124 that it's fairly clear, and I say fairly, about 25 times it's really clear, 124 times it's clear that it's the enabling power of God. There's one time which someone could say, no, no, it is a hug. However, there's still room to argue that no, it also still could be talking about the enabling power of God. And there's one time that it's a different uh, Greek word, euprepia, instead of charis. And so we have 126 mentions of the word grace. And there's an overwhelming evidence in the New Testament that it is to do with power. It is the labor of God to enable man to function as he ought to function. So what are we doing nowadays when we're coming up with a completely new definition of grace? Some of the best-selling books in Christianity, I think Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace, wins the Christian Book of the Year Award, is quoted by more pastors than any. It's completely redefined grace, and it doesn't even go to the Bible to define it. Where are we getting this from? Well, it's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. There's a quote in a book that really messes with the notions of grace. It's called The Ragamuffin Gospel by a man named Brennan Manning. And in it, he quotes Fyodor Dostoevsky. He says, Fyodor Dostoevsky caught the shock and scandal of the gospel of grace when he wrote, and this is what uh, Dostoevsky wrote, at the last judgment, Christ will say to us, come you also, come drunkards, come weaklings, come children of shame. And he will say to us, vile beings, you who are in the image of the beast and bear his mark, but come all the same, you as well. And the wise and prudent will say, Lord, why do you welcome them? And he will say, if I welcome them, you wise men, if I welcome them, you prudent men, it is because not one of them has ever been judged worthy. And he will stretch out his arms and he, we will fall at his feet and we will cry out sobbing and then we will understand all. We will understand the gospel of grace. Lord, your kingdom come. It's moving, it has pathos in it, where all of us are like, oh, praise God, that the gospel of grace accepts us no matter what we're like, except that's not what the gospel says. The gospel makes it very clear that God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble. If there is a belligerence towards God, if there isn't a turning in faith and in belief unto Jesus Christ, I'm sorry to say, but the grace of God is not open to us. It is the humble that receive grace. It is the penitent, it is the repentant that actually receive the gift of God in Christ Jesus. And so what we see is a denial of actually what the Word of God says and a redefinition of the concept of grace, and it feels good. And it itches people's ears because they want it to be that way. But the grace of God was made manifest at the cross, not in an empty hell. We want to say, well, if God really is love, if God really is gracious, wouldn't there be an empty hell? He wouldn't let anyone go there. That's why he came and shed his blood. The reason he gave up his life was because he is a God of grace, because he is a God of love. And he says, turn from your wickedness, believe and you will be saved. We also see Brennan Manning making a statement and he says it very clearly. So I'm going to read it. This is the gospel of grace. 
A God who out of love for us sent the only son he ever had, wrapped in our skin. He learned how to walk, stumbled and fell, cried for his milk, sweated blood in the night, was lashed with a whip and showered with spit, was fixed to a cross and died whispering forgiveness on us all. And you know, you and I could say that's, that's all true. Yeah, that's, that's fairly well put. But what we see is a diminishment of what grace really is. You see, it's not just that Jesus died. That's, that's, that's an aspect of God's grace at work. But he opened up the channel for us to access his grace in and through his work of grace on the cross. You see, it's not just that his grace was evidenced on the cross, it's that his grace was made available to us so that we might live And so that we might not just be dead in our sin, in our trespasses, but so that we might come to life in Christ Jesus, in his grace. And his grace might enable us to live as otherwise we couldn't live. There's more to the story. It's not just that he died whispering forgiveness on us all. How about the gospel of grace includes the fact that on the third day he rose again. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And you know where we're seated? We're seated in him. We have been brought near. When we believe in Christ, we're actually in him. And where he goes, we go. When he went to the cross, our old man was crucified. When he was buried, our old behavior was buried. And when he rose again, we rose to newness of life in Christ Jesus. And when he ascended, we sit with him at the right hand of authority and power. We become heirs of salvation. And we've been brought into the throne room of grace where there's a treasure chest of grace. And it can open up to us. And guess what's available? The very life of God. It's called grace. The very Spirit of God can be imparted to us so that we can live by grace. Not just be saved by it, but live by it. The God who did it 2,000 years ago desires to continue doing it in us. I call that the gospel of grace. You see, it's bigger, it's larger when we just say, oh, God forgives us. And so therefore, we still live in Adam. We still live in this old, sloppy, messy life. No. His grace has been made manifest to us so that we can live, so that we can actually bear the nature of God, so that we can show this world what Jesus is like. Not us. His grace does it in us. And that's the gospel of grace. You ain't seen nothing yet. God is raising ministers of righteousness all over the world. There is a great revolution on. And we are so glad we are part of it. In his book, Pure Grace, Clark Witten writes, Little has changed in the Protestant church in more than 500 years. He believes that Luther and Calvin got it right concerning justification or how one is saved, but they missed it on sanctification or how one is perfected into the likeness of Christ. When Martin Luther stood up over 400 years ago and with a revelation the just shall live by faith, justification by faith. And the grace revolution began with Martin Luther. And they try to kill him, they try to burn him, they try to silence him, okay? The devil opposed grace. And over the last 500, four and something hundred years, grace, the message of the gospel, has been recovered and has been recovered. But it is not fully recovered yet, friends. The gospel of grace that Paul preached is not being preached in the majority of churches around the world. Identifying himself as a new mystic, John Crowder says, Just as there is a new mysticism on the rise, I believe it is coupled with a new reformation. The good news will be preached with such clarity that even the days of Luther will seem utterly primitive in its concepts of grace and faith. Even the reformers were not reformed enough. In Grace, the Forbidden Gospel, Rob Rufus is quoted saying, The church today does not need another spiritual revival because revivals come and go. It needs another theological reformation as it did in the days of Martin Luther. Reformation will automatically bring about revival. Perhaps the most well-known hypergrace preacher, Joseph Prince, refers to a gospel revolution in his book, Destined to Reign, The Secret to Effortless Success, Wholeness and Victorious Living. Grace is not a teaching. It's not a curriculum in a Bible school, one of the topics you would learn. Grace is the gospel. Grace is the person of Jesus Christ. Grace is a person. And when you encounter the person, grace teaches. There's something about grace. When you encounter grace, it teaches you. Grace is a teacher. It teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. 
Amen, Pastor Prince, preach. No, we preach grace, and grace will teach. Aside from several articles appearing in Charisma News by Dr. Michael Brown, David Ravenhill, and others, there has been little exposing and refuting of the New Grace Reformation, also called Hyper Grace. Dr. Brown has also written Hyper Grace, exposing the dangers of the modern grace message. The problem is the message in the so-called New Grace Reformation goes beyond what Scripture says. It mixes in some dangerous elements with it that go beyond scriptural grace to the point that it's leading many believers into confusion, to the point that it's leading many believers to become uh, weak in terms of their resolve to resist sin because what does it matter? God sees me as perfect all the time. So it's actually a mixture. It's not a biblical grace message. I call it hyper grace because it goes beyond what scripture says. The proponents say it is hyper. It's the word Paul uses, hyper. Grace should be hyper. Well, not if you go beyond what Scripture says. Hey guys, I've got some good news for you this week. You know, there's this false moniker that's recently been placed on us. There's been a lot of monikers placed on us, but this one is called hyper grace, which in all honesty is a bit of a compliment because you can never over-exaggerate the depths of God's grace. Now let me tell you something, boys and girls. You haven't even sniffed the cork yet. This glory train's going to be so ADD hyper, you're going to have to put it on Ridlin. You can't over-exaggerate grace, but on the other hand, you can underestimate Jesus. And that is exactly what the adversaries of the gospel are doing these days, as usual, because it's really the scandal of the gospel that is so scandalous. Grace is personified in Jesus. He came into this world full of grace and truth. So when a person says you can go too far with grace, what they really mean is, what they might as well say is, you can go too far with Jesus. And I say, no, you can't. And uh, so you, you yeah. can't go too far with grace. No, you can't. Yeah. You, you, you overrun the grace base and you've left grace. And you moved into disgrace. Now, now and then you'll meet somebody. Probably the most prominent, best-known teacher that would be in this camp today is Joseph Prince. Again, I constantly hear from people who've been helped and liberated and blessed by his teaching, and then I hear from others where it's reactionary, where they've thrown out the baby with the bathwater, where we can't even call them to holiness or perseverance because of their, their reaction against certain scriptures. Uh, Andrew Womack would be a well-known teacher, uh, both of them somewhat in, in a word of faith camp. There are well-known grace authors like Steve McVeigh or Clark Whitten has become better known in recent years or uh, Dr. Paul Ellis. They all emphasize a number of the same key points and they all have the same reaction to our counterpoints. So even though it's not monolithic, there's a lot of similarity from one teacher to the next, and you'll find that many of the books repeat a lot of what Joseph Prince says originally. To be fair, the hyper-grace movement does not overtly teach that grace is a license to sin. It's all about grace. Amen. And there's always someone who's afraid that when you preach grace, you're getting people licensed to sin. But Romans 6.14, if you look on the screen, I just wonder sometimes people can read. It is so clear, Romans 6.14 tells us, For sin shall not have dominion over you, because for you are not under law, but you are under grace. So wherein comes this fear that when you teach grace, when, you, when people live under grace, they will live a licentious lifestyle. They will steer away from holiness. I find that when I'm under grace, my attraction to Jesus becomes stronger and stronger towards holiness, greater and greater, and my attraction towards sin gets lesser and lesser. How many can say amen to that? When you hear stuff like you heard today, or what you heard today, does it kind of just make you want to run out and sin all over town? Just be lascivious all over town? That's a dirty word, isn't it? Lascivious? Sounds like, yeah. No. 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 Does grace allow us to sin? Now, grace preachers are often accused of allowing people to sin. But in reality, this accusation is absolutely false. 
No one who truly preaches grace is saying that it is all right to sin or giving people permission to do what is wrong. The hyper-grace accusation has built up this straw man argument that's simply not true. That we're somehow preaching license to sin. Grace is not license to sin. It is freedom from sin. I am still trying to figure out uh, who are these mythical preachers who say you should go sin to your heart's content. I suppose with Facebook, there could be plenty of nut jobs out there saying that, but I don't know how I got looped in with any of it. We've been preaching God-given holiness that manifests in real God-given right living for years. Grace is not a cover-up. He's a person. Grace is literally defined as the divine influence of God upon a man. It's like a wind that fills your sails and drives you and, and works mightily through you with his supernatural energy. You can only live holy holy when you realize that's who he made you to be. Nevertheless, hyper-grace is an exaggeration and distortion of biblical grace, the end result being similar to that of the grace changers which the apostles spoke against. Oh, what, what? If you preach like that, people go out and sin. Notice that people will still sin. Biblical grace is, is wonderfully important because every one of us is saved by grace by God reaching out to us when we didn't deserve it. If God gave us what our sins deserve, if God treated us justly and, and outside of grace, outside of the cross, we'd all be damned and doomed forever. So we're all indebted to God's grace. We're all indebted to the fact that he reached out to us when we were lost, that his son died on the cross for the things that we did. And when people speak of grace, they sometimes say it's God's riches at Christ's expense or it's unmerited favor. That's the heart and soul of it. But the amazing thing about grace is it doesn't end there. It's not just, I was saved by grace 42 or 43 years ago, way back then. No, God's grace has continued to work in my life, forgiving me as I fall short and as I look to God for mercy, and also empowering me to live a new and changed life. So to the extent we understand God's grace, we can live free of condemnation, we can live transformed lives, and we can really exemplify to the world who Jesus is through transformed lives. The scriptures tell us that we are saved by grace. Our salvation is a free gift, not earned or merited by our own works. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. God loved us while we were sinners by sending His Son Jesus Christ into the world. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Pharisees said, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. The Pharisees did not understand grace. By grace, God has initiated and offered salvation to sinners. We weren't received because we were good enough. We were received because God is gracious. Boasting is excluded because this was not something we deserved or merited by any good works of our own. By God's grace, He accepted us, forgave us, and redeemed us. But in those same passages, Paul went on to say that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, and those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Paul is a pattern of how God's grace turns a lost, sinful, hateful person into a beloved brother. By grace, Paul was forgiven, received, taught, and changed. He said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Scripture is actually very clear on the fact that grace is not merely just a hug from God. It is enabling power. It is power to perform that which is otherwise impossible. It's power to actually obey God. We couldn't obey before. There was something we wanted to do, but we didn't have the substance within our souls to be able to actually pull it off. But now the grace of God has been revealed in Jesus Christ, and we have what we need in Christ Jesus, not in ourselves, in Christ to be able to actually live out the life that we're called to, which is impossible, actually. So technically, grace is power to live the impossible life. And so what I want to do is I want to just give a, a brief overview of some of the key concepts of how grace is used in the New Testament, just to back this point. We see in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, says Paul. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Well, what's laboring in Paul? The grace of God. That's not a hug. So what we see is that grace is given that we might labor more abundantly. In 2 Corinthians 9, 8, Paul is again making this argument. He says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So what did they need to have sufficiency in all things and to abound to every good work? Grace. You see, grace enables the Christian to actually do that which they're called to do. So we see that grace is given that we may have sufficiency in all things, and grace is also given that we may abound to every good work. In Romans 1.5, Paul is saying, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So they received grace for the strangest thing. I thought it was just a hug to cover over our sin. No, that's not the way grace is used in the New Testament. He received grace for obedience to the faith. So grace is given for obedience to the faith. In Acts 4.33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Well, grace is given as power for witnessing of the resurrection of Jesus. And then in 1 Corinthians 3.10, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So grace is given in order that we may lay foundations. In other words, this is a master builder's toolbox. He needs grace. How is Paul going to go about and be a master builder of the church? Well, he does it with grace. And then in Ephesians 3, 8, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach. Why did he receive grace? To preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So grace is given for preaching among the Gentiles. Let us therefore come boldly, it says in Hebrews 4, 16, unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to, for, grace to help in time of need. 
So grace is given as our means of help in time of need. So what does God give us in a time of need? He doesn't just give us a hug. He gives us help, practical help. Well, what is that help? It's grace. And in Hebrews 12, 28, wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Grace is given whereby we may serve God acceptably. And then in 1 Peter 5, 10, this one's a loaded scripture. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Grace is given to make us perfect. Grace is given to establish us. Grace is given to strengthen us. And grace is given to settle us. And then in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Grace is given to save us. And then... Acts 18, 27, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. Grace is given to enable others to believe in Jesus Christ. This is powerful stuff. Grace works. You see, it is the work of God. The cross is the work of God. It is an expression of grace. But what, does, what do we need now to live the Christian life? We need God to work to work within us, to work for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us, not just on the cross, but he ever lives to do it. So he lives and the way he does it is through grace. That's the term for it in the Bible. God laboring on our behalf to accomplish what only God can accomplish. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Grace covers our sins. But allowing sin and covering sin are two different things. Paul said that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. On the other hand, Paul also asked the rhetorical question, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Hypergrace teachers agree with these passages being understood in this sense. Paul will argue things like, well, shall we sin that grace may abound? May it never be. It's an impossibility. How shall we who are dead? Once you're dead, you're dead. How can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Jesus has set us free from sin that we might not be slaves of sin any longer. But we must act upon this. In order to obtain God's grace or favor, we must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thus we are saved by grace through faith. We have access to God's saving grace through faith in Christ. Paul wrote, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. But that's only the beginning. Grace says both, neither do I condemn you, and go and sin no more. Biblical grace is saving grace. It's transforming grace. You know, by grace are you saved. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You go back a couple of verses, it says you, you were dead in trespasses and sins, but God made us alive. And so grace has got that power to make us alive, to transform us, to change us from what we were, to become uh, new creatures in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. I mean, that's the power of grace, is uh, the power to change. And uh, Paul says, you know, you're no longer under sin, uh, uh, grace... Uh, we're no longer in the, the, the dominion of sin. Uh, grace has a greater dominion than sin's dominion. And so we've got to understand that uh, saving grace is transforming grace. It's, it's the power of God working in us and through us to bring about God's desired result of uh, having children in his own uh, likeness and image. Paul went on to say that grace has freed us from slavery of sin to become slaves of obedience to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, 
You are that one slave to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. This is not fear that being under grace will cause licens licentiousness. Because the Bible states clearly in Romans 6.14, if you look up here, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for or because you are not under law, but under grace. But what we have believed is that when you are under grace, sin will have dominion over you. We've been hoodwinked by the devil. But the word of God is so clear. When you are under grace and not under law, sin shall not have dominion over you. The word sin there is a noun. You can put faith in shall not have dominion over you. Sickness shall not have dominion over you. Poverty shall not have dominion over you. When? When you are not under law, but under grace. As far as Joseph Prince is a person, I don't think his intention is to get people to sin. I think the fruit of his teaching leads to that, leads to a loose lifestyle, it leads to uh, carnality and so on and so forth. You know, I think that's uh, the fruit. I don't think he's teaching, you know, go out and sin, do whatever you want sort of thing. But I, I think the, uh, the doctrine ultimately leads to that. Notice Romans 3.25 says, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. But the hypergrace movement teaches that Christians have been forgiven of their past, present, and future sins. In his book Unmerited Favor, Joseph Prince writes, His grace is cheapened when you think that he has only forgiven you of your sins up to the time you got saved, and after that point, you have to depend on your confession of sins to be forgiven. God's forgiveness is not given in installments. Paul Ellis says, Forgiveness seems to be a blind spot for many people. We just can't get it into our heads that God has forgiven us completely and for all time. In his sermon entitled, Totally Forgiven, Totally United, Totally Filled, Ryan Rufus says the following, You have been totally forgiven. You haven't been partially forgiven. You have been totally and completely and utterly and fully and absolutely forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future. Amen? Most Christians don't have any trouble believing that Jesus forgives them of all their past sins. But many Christians have trouble believing that Jesus has already forgiven them of all of their future sins. They struggle with that. So they feel they have this need that if they sin, they've got to confess the sin and repent of the sin and be cleansed of the sin. And they enter into all of these dead works, faithless works, because they don't have a revelation of total forgiveness. The idea that God has already pronounced our future sins forgiven is unscriptural, and it's at the heart and root of the error of the hypergrace message. He cleansed me of my sin. Past sins, present sin, future sin. He cleansed me of my sins. I'm clean. You are already forgiven. So if you ever make a mistake, just tell God you're sorry and say, Thank you, Jesus. My sins are forgiven. But if we understand that we have been completely forgiven for all of our sins, past, present, and even future, because all of our sins were future when Jesus died. Sometimes people say, You mean God, you're saying God forgive, has forgiven me for sins I haven't even committed? Mm. And I'll say, Well, uh, when did Jesus take your sins into and upon himself? At the cross. Well, how many of them had you committed then? None of them. They were all future at that time. Yes, God's forgiven us for the sins of our lifetime. And when we understand that, that we have received total forgiveness, then we're able to relax about ourselves. God took sovereign initiative out of his goodness of his grace to have his son crucified at the cross, whereby he forgave all of our sins, past, present, and future at the cross. All of us are forgiven when we accept Christ of our past, present, and future sins.
According to the hypergrace message, the moment you're saved, God not only says, I forgive you for everything you've done in the past, I forgive you for your present and past guilt, in the language of Colossians 2, wiping out the IOU that, that was against us, that, that written debt that we owed all this to God that we could never repay. But the hypergrace message also says, the moment you're saved, God pronounces your future sins forgiven. The moment we're saved, God puts us in the righteous column, the forgiven column, the column of being his children, and he now relates to us differently. But if I fall short, if I blow it, it's appropriate to say, Father, wash me, cleanse me. I, I, I sin. It's appropriate to confess our sins. It's appropriate to ask to be forgiven. Now, here's where the hypergrace people are right. We're in the forgiven column. In other words, God's not dealing with us as lost sinners who need to repent and be saved again. In the language of Jesus in John 13, we've had a bath, we're already cleansed, but our feet get dirty as we walk in this world. So we need to get our feet washed. That's what 1 John 1, 7 and 1, 9 talk about. But this idea that God has already pronounced my future sins forgiven leads to all kinds of other errors. For example, God will never bring up to me my past sin. He doesn't say to me, Mike, you shot heroin 43 years ago. You stole money from your father. No, I've been forgiven. That's under the blood. Well, if my future sins are already forgiven, then why would God bring those up to me? What do you do with Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount? That if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. Simple. You say those words don't apply to us today if you're in the hyper grace camp. Those were just for the Jews before the cross. What do you do with James, the fifth chapter, speaking about a brother who's very sick? God will forgive that sin. If it was already forgiven, why is God going to forgive it then? What about in the, in the fifth chapter, James, verse 16? Confess your sins one to another. Well, why, why are we confessing our sins one to another? If God's already forgiven them, we shouldn't have any consciousness of them anymore. If my sins are already forgiven, the Holy Spirit won't convict me, and on and on. So this is the basic root error in the hypergrace teaching, the idea that the moment you're saved, God pronounces your future sins forgiven, and he will never deal with you based on those future sins again. A provision was made, but pardon has to be received the moment we repent. Um, I have, and I've, uh, I was going to write a, bl a blog about this. This is hand cleanser, sanitizer. Everybody carries one almost, you know, you get it in various sizes and so on. I've had this literally for years and years. I paid for it possibly five years ago at least. I paid for it. It was paid for. But it continues to work. Now, I don't use it just once. You know, I take it out and I use it once and I never have to use it again. No, I can use it when necessary. It was paid for. Provision was made when I, when I paid for it. Jesus Christ made provision for our cleansing at the cross. But, he, but it's, it's ever active in that sense. It's a new and living way. He ever lives to make intercession. Jesus spoke about being forgiven on an ongoing basis, not that God forgave all of our sins, past, present, and future. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Our forgiveness is conditioned upon our forgiving others who sin against us. Jesus also taught, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Note what Jesus said in the parable of the unforgiving servant. First of all, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus responded, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. 
Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry, and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. In the parable, the servant had already been forgiven, but he was delivered to the tormentors because he did not forgive his brother. Being delivered to the tormentors cannot possibly be the fate of a saved person. This servant's past sins were forgiven, but the forgiveness of his future sins was conditioned upon his forgiving others. When a forgiven Christian does not forgive his brother, God's forgiveness will be revoked, and the penalty will be reinstated. If you refuse to forgive others, even though you have already been forgiven by God, then you won't be forgiven after all. He says, forgive others, and, and then you'll be forgiven. You know, if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. And it's like, we don't teach this. I mean, Billy Graham is not in a stadium telling people, you want to be forgiven? Well, if you forgive others, then God will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, God will not forgive you. That's not the message that Billy Graham preaches. That's not the gospel that we share today with unbelievers. Dr. Ellis claims that before the cross, Jesus preached conditional forgiveness, forgive to be forgiven. Dr. Ellis has a real problem with the conditional forgiveness taught by the Lord Jesus. He writes, Jesus said, If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is not good news. This is bad news that should make us shake in our boots, for it links God's forgiveness to our own. It is not grace. It is law. It is quid pro quo and tit for tat. It is something you must give to get. Later we will answer the question, Are Jesus' words for us? It is sufficient for now to quote the Apostle Paul who wrote his epistles after the cross. Still, forgiveness is imperative for Christian living. He says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. How many people who are professing followers of Jesus, if they were honest, wouldn't have to say at some points along the way, you know, there's a person over here that I haven't forgiven them. I haven't forgiven them. Well, if that's the case, I would say to that person, you better be afraid. You better be very afraid because by your own understanding of doctrine, you won't be forgiven by God because you've not forgiven others. And in reality, what that then points us to is the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross was not effective because your forgiveness, your unforgiveness has nullified the cross. It is not that unforgiveness has nullified the cross. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 18 that the penalty would be reinstated if the forgiven servant did not forgive others. Unforgiveness is ungodly and a sign of perilous times, as Paul said in Romans 1, 28-31 and 2 Timothy 3, 1-5. I said I was nearly finished. I lied. <laughs> but I'm forgiven. <laughs> Many hypergrace teachers have stated that their teachings on grace do not give us a license to sin. But according to them, sin does not separate a person from fellowship with God. 
Joseph Prince writes, Because you did nothing to deserve his presence in your life, there is nothing you can do that will cause his presence to leave you. Philip Yancey, talking about grace in his, I want to say it's an award-winning book, What's So Amazing About Grace? Grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. No amount of spiritual calisthenics and renunciations, no amount of crusading on behalf of righteous causes. And grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. No amount of racism or pride or pornography or adultery or even murder. Grace means that God already loves us as much as an infinite God can possibly love. I cannot moderate my definition of grace because the Bible forces me to make it as sweeping as possible. God is the God of all grace, in the Apostle Peter's words. And grace means there is nothing I can do to make God love me more, and nothing I can do to make God love me less. It means that I, even I, who deserve the opposite, am invited to take my place at the table in God's family. He's making it sound like the Bible is forcing him to make this as the definition of grace. But that actually isn't what grace is. You see, we are cut off from grace under the law of sin and death. We sin, we die. The tree of life has been cut off to us. There's cherubims with a flaming sword, and they block the way to the tree of life. But the way has been made available to us in Christ Jesus. And so we have been brought into the grace of God, which we could call Jesus the life of God, the power of God, but that has been cut off to us. And in that life, we live. And so grace is the manifest presence, the enabling power, the gift of God unto us in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's not just that he forgives us of our sins. We are wretches and he forgives us. It's that he actually imparts to us his life. There is a throne room. It's called the throne of grace. And it's been made open to us and so that we can boldly enter into it to obtain mercy and to find help, grace for help in time of need. It's not just God loving us and overlooking every fault that we have. It's God intimately acquainted with our life saying, I know what you need and I've made it available to you. Come to me and I will supply you with grace so that you might live. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you more. No amount of spirituality, trying to impress how legalistic you are with other people. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. No sin, no error, no evil that you can commit. I mean, look at David, look at Paul, look at Peter. They all committed terrible crimes. Nothing you can do to make God love you more. Nothing you can do to make God love you less. An infinite God already loves you as much as God possibly can. Hmm. And that, if we could understand that, then we'd have a a little glimpse of what God's grace is. Such a statement is misleading because many will equate God's love to God's fellowship. But there is an important distinction between love and fellowship. God so loved the world that he gave his son. But he does not have fellowship with the world because they have not received his son. Those in the lake of fire are not going to be thinking that there was nothing they could do or not do to make God love them more or less. Yes, God loved even them, but he loved them by sending his Son. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is love. God sending his Son was grace or unmerited favor toward us in his love. But if you reject God's Son or rebel from Jesus Christ, then you are rejecting his love and fellowship. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Yeah. And, and so those that are watching who think that sin changes God's attitude toward us, I'll tell you this will set you free if you understand that our sin doesn't change how God feels toward us. Yeah. It's, he, he loves us the same all the time. If he doesn't love us because of how wonderful our behavior is. He doesn't reject us because of how bad our behavior is. He loves us because he is love. And that's his nature to love, and that's what he does. God's love for us 
is not the same thing as salvation, or else there would be universal salvation. God doesn't stop loving us when we disobey Him. However, that doesn't mean He is going to give us everlasting life either. If a congregation has to put someone out of fellowship for the purpose of church discipline, that does not mean they don't love the person anymore. But sin does affect God's attitude toward us. Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. In Grace, the Forbidden Gospel, the author writes, Jesus already paid the full price so that we could have unbroken fellowship with the Father. This means that when we make a mistake, it does not break our fellowship or right standing with God. It is false to teach that our fellowship with God cannot be broken. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If we do not abide in Jesus and thereby produce fruit, then we will be cast out and burned. But God will not cast you out for making a mistake in ignorance. The author of Hebrews says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. As the hymn says, There is a time we know not when, a point we know not where, that marks the destiny of men to glory or despair. There is a line by us unseen that crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. There comes a point where our fellowship with God can be broken if we fall short of the grace of God. Consider Jesus' words in Revelation 3.20. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. This passage is often quoted by evangelists for unbelievers, but Jesus was standing outside of the church. This church was not in fellowship with Christ. But Jesus was knocking on the door for any individual who would let him in for fellowship. Jesus loved this church, but he was standing outside and calling them to repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Then all of this jargon that I've invented, you know, I'm out of fellowship, now I'm back in, I went to church, oops, I said the Lord's name in vain, now I'm out of fellowship again, now I'm back in because I did my quiet time, oop, you know, uh, I, uh, I, you know, stubbed my toe and cursed and whatever, now I'm out again, this in and out and in and out of fellowship thing. Well, the scripture says that we are one spirit with him. Anyone who has joined himself to the Lord, Corinthians says, is one spirit with him. Andrew Farley mocks the idea that Christians can lose their fellowship with God, citing 1 Corinthians. But Paul also said in 1 Corinthians, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God never, never, ever, ever, ever withdraws his presence from you ever. You're in union with Him. I would say persistent, deliberate sin ultimately cuts a person off from God. I don't think one sin by any stretch of the imagination, if you are truly a born-again believer, first of all, John says, he that is born of God does not commit sin, meaning he doesn't practice sin. We all stumble in many ways, and uh, we're not immune from uh, temptation and falling and so on. But I don't think the first sin, you know, God sort of wipes his hands off us and say, you know, I can't, I can't wait to get rid of you sort of thing. No, God's got incredible patience. We've got the story of Jezebel in uh, Revelation 2. And God said, I gave her time to repent. I gave her time. God's got incredible patience. You know, he waited a hundred years during the construction of the ark, not willing that any should perish. And so having said that, I don't think we should by any means, you know, test the patience of God. Uh, I think a lot of people misconstrue God's patience with God's permission. And that's a dangerous thing.
In other words, you know, I can still prophesy, I can still whatever, speak in tongues, I can still, you know, some particular gift that I have is still operating. People are still getting saved under my ministry, even though I'm sleeping around or whatever. You know, we are, and, and therefore it can't be that big a sin in the eyes of God. Otherwise, he would have sort of killed me long ago. No, that's God's patience, not God's permission. So there were two ways in which an Israelite could be cut off from God. One if he never applied the blood to the doorpost, you know, going back to the Passover. In other words, if he did not avail himself of the blood, the death angel would have taken him. But he says, after having applied the blood, if he refused to remove leaven from his house, the Bible says he was cut off. In other words, God's intention is, I redeemed you by the blood of the lamb. Now that you're redeemed, I expect you to walk in purity uh, in a, a sanctified way, if you like, because he said seven days you shall remove leaven from your house. Seven is always the, the number of perfection, always a, a number of completion and so on. And so God was saying, I've redeemed you by the blood of the lamb. Now it's your job to get rid of any uh, leaven in your house, leaven, which is a type of sin. And it says, if you don't do that, in other words, if you don't walk in obedience to my word, then you will be cut off. But it wasn't one day, it wasn't one hour, it wasn't one minute, it was seven days. In other words, it was a period of time. So I think, you know, we need to understand God is patient with us. But I think if we persist in sin, ultimately, there is a cutting off. Now, when that day comes, when that time comes, I don't know. You know, we can't put it down to so many days or so many hours. But uh, my spirit will not always strive with man forever. I, I don't want to test the patience of God. You know, especially when I can avail myself of the blood of Christ and uh, walk in liberty and freedom. You know. Self and sin are not listed among those things which cannot separate us from God. There are no external forces which can separate us from God, but our own sins will separate us from God. In fact, Isaiah the prophet said, But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Dunn writes, The old life has been destroyed. You can dig as much as you want, but you will find no remnants of this old life buried in the gospel. This makes joy and happiness come effortlessly for the believer. Ryan Rufus says, There is no sinful nature in there. There is no sin. There is no unrighteousness. No, your spirit has received fullness, full perfection, full righteousness. John Crowder writes, I no longer even have an independent self that is capable of pleasing God. It is no longer I but Christ. There is no separate individual you. Christ has replaced you. Saved people don't sin. Romans chapter 5, we mentioned last night, for just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The core foundation of what we were drinking, guys, you got to understand, we are drinking from the source of this revelation that we are no longer sinners, we are no longer longer some saint sinner hybrid that you have to spend your whole life trying to overcome that sinful nature beat up that old man beat up that old nature put to death that old nature this is absolute absolute anti-christ garbage from the pit of hell it is the core foundation of religion is this idea that you as a believer are still a sinner something that's a very dangerous deception it's kind of a new gnosticism it says this well, 1 John 3, that whoever is born of God cannot sin because the seed of God remains in him, therefore he cannot sin. Well, how do we understand that? We understand that in terms of habitually practicing sin. If you truly know the Lord, then you cannot habitually continue to sin. If you do, then 1 John says either you never knew God at all, you're, you're just a liar, right? So what is the, the hyper-grace extreme interpretation? It would say this, the seed of God remains in me, therefore I can't sin. But I do sin. No, 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 that's not really me. I am a spirit. 
and my spirit is perfectly born again, and my spirit is perfectly redeemed, and my spirit can't sin. All sin is of the flesh. And since my flesh is not really me, if I do something wrong, it's not me. It's, it's sin that is doing the evil work. It's not actually me. One of my friends called the pastor, of the church he was attending, and he said, I just need a yes or no answer. Do you sin? Yes or no? And the pastor said no. And then he proceeded to explain, what I mean is I am a born-again spirit. My spirit is perfect. My spirit cannot sin. Therefore, I do not sin. Whatever is born of God cannot sin. And if there is sin, it's my flesh, and that's not really who I am. Again, utterly bizarre. I've seen it defended. I've not heard it defended by mainstream teachers uh, in the hyper-grace camp, but some just a little bit on the fringe, they've been teaching it. They've been defending it. And again, it's this separation, this Gnostic separation of spirit from material. The fact is God deals with me as a whole human being, spirit, soul, body, and I will stand before him and give account for the deeds I did in the body. Again, another dangerous deception. We all sin even after we get saved, but God does not see our sin any longer. He sees Jesus. In Jesus, there is no sin. When God looks at someone who has been born again, he sees Jesus standing there in our place. If you have been born of God, you do not sin and you cannot sin. This interpretation is obviously inconsistent with the rest of John's epistle and the rest of scripture. John says also, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Clark Witten says that Christians can sin, but they are not sinners. Jesus' blood cleanses, washes, though they be as crimson, they shall be as wool, though they are red, they shall be white as snow. He cleanses us of our sins, removes them from us as far as the east is from the west. That's why you're not a sinner. You can sin, but you're not a sinner. Does that make sense? To Clark Witten, it is on the basis of the forgiveness of sins alone that one is counted righteous. But John told us that those who have been truly born of God do not practice sinning. Therefore, John said it is manifest by their deeds who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Witten said that unrighteous deeds do not make a righteous person unrighteous and that righteous deeds do not make an unrighteous person righteous. Now let me ask you this. Does the unrighteous deed that the righteous person does make the righteous person unrighteous? No. Deeds didn't make him righteous to start with. There's no, deeds don't make you righteous or unrighteous. You understand? There's only one way to become righteous or in right standing with God, and that's through the blood of Christ. That's faith in Jesus. That's His finished work produces that. You don't. You can't. Ever. So, does the unrighteous deed that the righteous man does make the righteous man unrighteous? No. All right, let me ask you this. Does the righteous deed that the unrighteous man make the unrighteous man righteous? No. No, you don't get righteous by doing deeds. It's by faith in Christ. You believe. But the prophet Ezekiel wrote, The righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, 
he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous, he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered, but because of the iniquity that he has committed he shall die. Again when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Yet the children of your people say, The way of the Lord is not fair, but it is their way which is not fair. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say, The way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. Do righteous deeds make people righteous? No. Do righteous deeds keep them righteous? No. It's a permanent, listen, it's a permanent God-performed miracle. Righteous. I don't feel like that. Always. Or ever, really. But I am. I don't care whether you feel like it or not. You are. If you believe in Jesus. Certainly belief in Christ is essential. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But Abraham was not a wicked man. By faith Abraham obeyed. The Apostle John wrote, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Scripture teaches, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. But must a Christian continue to confess their sins in true repentance? Joseph Prince says, My friend, this is the assurance you can have today. The day you received Christ, you confessed all your sins once for all. Now that verse said that uh, he wasn't counting people's trespasses against them. Does that mean that I don't need to ask for his forgiveness? Bingo. In fact, it insults the finished work of Christ when you do ask for forgiveness. I want to tell you now, there is no scripture in the New Covenant for New Covenant believers that tells you that you need to continually confess your sins and repent of your sins and ask for forgiveness of your sins and get cleansed of your sins. Why? Because one sacrifice for all time for all of your sins has already dealt with every single one of your sins. It's absolutely right and appropriate for believers to confess their sins to God. It's, it's what you do in a relationship. If, if I was short with my wife one day and then I left the house abruptly and, and then I came back two or three hours later, you better believe the first thing I would say is, honey, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. That, that was completely wrong. I, I can't believe I treated you like that. Forgive me. That's wrong. And I was so insensitive. I didn't even call. But it's, it's what you do in a relationship. It's common courtesy. I interacted with a hypergrace teacher once and said, would you do that with your wife? He said, of course, but I'm not, I'm not married to God. I have a different relationship with God. I thought, what in the world are you talking about? All the analogies in Scripture, God and Israel, the husband and wife, and, and Jesus and the church, the husband and wife, and the relationship we have and the intimacy we have, of course. And 1 John 1, 9, which is not written to unbelievers, contextually in 1 John, it's clearly believers. Scholars recognize that of 1 John. And the Greek is speaking of ongoing, continuous, not a one-time thing. If we confess our sins in an ongoing way, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, here's the point. This is, this is what's so important. I'm not confessing my sins in order to be saved. And I'm not confessing my sins with the notion that if I miss one sin one day, I'm going to hell. 
Again, there's some people that live like that. And, and then they hear the hyper-grace message and you don't need to confess, just agree with God that you're righteous and that your sins are already forgiven. And it's helpful for them because they've been so sin conscious that all through the day, all the like, oh, I, I sinned again. Oh, I, I didn't confess the sin right. Oh, I confessed it with pride. And they're in this, this continual rut. If, if I fail to confess a sin, let's say the end of the day, I did not confess to the sin of prayerlessness. And I was oblivious to the fact that I was too busy to commune with God that day. I'm not going to hell if I fall asleep and, 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 and die in the middle of the night. That's not what it's about. It's relational. It's the forgiveness that comes within the family. Of course it's right, of course it's proper, it's, it's common etiquette in a relationship, and it helps us keep our conscience clear. And it helps us be conscious of, of failings in our lives. In other words, if I just kind of look the other way as if it never happened, I could harden my heart. I could become accustomed to doing something wrong. Whereas when I get alone with God and I say, Father, I'm, I'm so sorry, I, 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 I'm your child, I love you, I didn't act in accordance with that today. It's not really who I am, but what I did was ugly and I shouldn't have treated that person like that. Lord, please forgive me, wash me. There's communion that comes out of it. And there's a sense of fresh cleansing that comes out of it. That's a healthy thing, not an unhealthy thing. There was a young man who wrote to me from New York. He's now in his 20s. But ever since he was 13 years old, he was bound to pornography. And he'll watch it almost every day. And he says this, and Pastor Prince, as a, as a martial artist, you know, I'm highly disciplined. And I use all my discipline as a Christian to try to overcome this bad habit. But I couldn't overcome it. It's an addiction. But when I heard your message, that when you sin, confess I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Confess that you are still righteous in Christ. I have so many testimonies of people who are bound to drugs, addicted to, to uh, 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 cigarettes, all right, and, and all kinds of bad habits, okay, eating disorders, while they are indulging, while they are doing it, I teach them, confess I am the righteousness of God in Christ. They'll still do it. Might as well confess it. And when they're confessing, the devil will say, you are a hypocrite. How can you confess that? But the Bible says when you receive the gift of righteousness, you will reign in life. And when you reign in life, your addictions don't. When you reign in life, the evil habit doesn't. When you reign in life, the devil doesn't. Because you are reigning. Nowhere does the Bible teach that reigning in life is achieved by confessing you're righteous when you're actually unrighteous and continuing in sin. According to Ryan Rufus, Many Christians, when they sin, they, they feel unrighteous, they feel dirty, they feel unholy, they feel like they've let God down, they feel like God is no longer pleased with them, and they feel like they need to, oh, I need to do something. They feel guilty, so that guilt drives them to want to do something to get rid of their sin or to get rid of the guilt of their sin. That's, that guilt wants to lead them to try to get rid of their sins. So they feel like they need to confess, God, I've, I've got to confess my sins. I've got to repent of these terrible sins. I've got to get cleansed of these sins. I've, I've, I've got to promise that I'll never do this sin again. We are not called to confess our sins. We are, con we are called to confess our righteousness in Jesus Christ. Rufus goes so far as to say that to ask for forgiveness is a sin. But as a new covenant, born again believer, to now go and ask for forgiveness for after you sinned, after you sinned, to now go and ask for forgiveness is a sin. It's the sin of unbelief. It's the sin of unbelief because you don't believe in the finished work of the cross. You're trying to add to it. You're trying to do something. You don't realize it was already done. Hyper grace has redefined the confession of sins to the confession of righteousness. You see, once you start listing all your sins, you will never run out of things to repent of. In contrast, the person who understands grace says to God, God, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ covers all of my sins. 
The hyper-grace teachers go so far as saying we must repent of repenting, and that repentance is idolatry. That so often we try to repent and prove our repentance and show how sorry we are. That's idolatry, you know. You know why it's idolatry? Because if I think I have to show my sorrow and I have to wallow in self-condemnation and I have to rededicate myself and promise God this or that, then what I'm really saying is I don't believe the work of the cross was enough to deal with sin. I, there's a contribution I need to add to it. And what I add is going to put it over the top. <laughs> right? <laughs> Idolatry. Let's just relax. We're forgiven. Let's just believe in the finished work of Christ. Ongoing repentance is idolatry? Writing to the Corinthians, who were already Christians, Paul the Apostle said that they were clear in a certain sinful matter because of their godly sorrow which produced true repentance characterized by indignation against sin and fear of God. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Speaking to the hyper-grace community, Michael Brown asked, We agree that the Holy Spirit never condemns us for our sins as believers, but does He ever make us uncomfortable when we sin? To which Paul Ellis responded, Jesus called Him the Comforter, not the Discomforter, so I guess not. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the Comforter and Helper, but the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey Him. Peter said, and we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And the Holy Spirit does not comfort those in disobedience. Notice the refrain from Revelation, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What did the Holy Spirit say to these churches? Jesus said to these various churches, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. You have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds." I will kill their children with death, and the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your works. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. Obviously, the Spirit spoke words of discomfort to the churches to help them repent of their sins. Does the Holy Spirit convict unbelievers of their sins? Well, that is a common view that you'll hear all the time, that the Holy Spirit convicts unbelievers of their sins. And for that matter, you'll even hear the Holy Spirit convicts believers for their sins. But that's, that's not true. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, when we teach that, we're, we're reinforcing a faulty idea. Uh, over in John 16 and verse 8, it says, When the, he, the Spirit, comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. That's central. Yeah. Uh, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. But this thing of the Holy Spirit convicting unbelievers of sin... He said, convicted of sin because they do not believe in me. What we need to understand is that sin is not an issue. God, through Jesus, at the, or in Jesus at the cross, has dealt with the whole issue of sin. The Bible says that he came to, pay, he came to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yeah. You know, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said, Behold, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Over in 1 John 3, 3, he said, you know that he appeared to take away sin. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. So when we talk about being convinced, unbelievers being convinced something about their sins, he puts that phrase with it, yeah. it is that they don't believe in me. Well, yeah. believe what? What unbelievers need, and believers too for that matter, is to be convinced that Jesus has taken our sin away. The Holy Spirit never comes yeah. to any of us and says, you know, you need to stop you know, using bad language, and you need to stop getting drunk, and you need to stop. He doesn't come to us about that because God has dealt with our sins. What he does is he comes to us and says, let me convince you about who you are. Let me convince you about what Jesus has done. McVeigh further claims the Holy Spirit will convict an unbeliever of only one thing, his unbelief in Jesus Christ. He will show that person where he stands so that he can enter into the experience of knowing God through Jesus. McVeigh misunderstands John 16, 8 through 11, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. In the passage, sin does not refer only to the sin of unbelief. The Greek word hamartia is often translated as sins, plural. For example, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Peter responded to the people, Repent therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And Jesus said it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convict of sins. It is God's grace that the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. But according to Joseph Prince, the Holy Spirit never convicts Christians of your sins. He never comes to point out your faults. It does not take a revelation from the Holy Spirit to see that you have failed. However, when you know that you have failed, what you do need is for the Holy Spirit to convict you of your righteousness. When you sin, look to the cross and say, Lord, thank you, it's paid for. If you don't do that, something inside you, your DNA is very smart. When you condemn yourself, it seems like the cells of your body say, he wants to condemn himself, he wants to hurt himself. Let's create a disease. Doctors call it psychosomatic, autoimmune disorders when your body fights against itself. People are sick today not because of sin. Sin is taken care of. People are sick because of condemnation. Condemnation kills. So when you sin, what do you do? Look away from self to the cross and say, Father, thank you. There is my judgment. There is my beating. And all the cells in your body go, Peace, boys, relax. The price is paid. It is finished. It is finished. Hallelujah. It is well. Many adherents of hypergrace, when they hear the word convict, they think it means condemn. You are now guilty. Convicted. 
The court convicts you of this crime. Biblical conviction does not mean that. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins, and by the way, the same word that's used for convict in John 16, that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, that same Greek word is used for rebuke or reprove in quite a few other passages in the New Testament, including Revelation 3.19, where Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. Same Greek word there for rebuke, therefore be zealous and repent. So condemnation is you're guilty away from me. Condemnation is gavel comes down, convict it, out of here, next. You know, next criminal, bring them in, and then we'll send them away. If you're a child of God, you never come under his condemnation. If you're a child of God, Romans 8, 1, there is no damnation. There is no doom. There is no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Jesus. Conviction is God's loving rebuke. It's a good thing God makes us uncomfortable in our sins. There's some people that their nerves are dead, and, and they can put their hands literally on a burning stove, and they don't know it. But the problem is, it's still going to burn, and that's going to damage their hand even further. If we become insensitive to our sins, that opens the door to all types of, of deception and backsliding and compromise. So the Holy Spirit in his love doesn't condemn us. Not what conviction means there, but he lovingly rebukes us, makes us uncomfortable, so that we'll turn from that sin, which is so hateful and destructive, and turn to God and receive his mercy. The word effortless is also used by Andrew Womack in the title of his book, Effortless Change. The word is the seed that can change your life. In the book he writes, Effortless change, it sounds impossible, yet that's what the word reveals about how the kingdom of God works. He continues, In this book I want to share with you some truths from the word of God that can totally transform the way you understand and approach change. If you receive these truths into your heart and apply them to your life, you'll be able to see change take place in your life effortlessly. Joseph Prince teaches, My friend, there is no middle road. You cannot mix your own efforts with God's grace. He says, When you receive completely what Jesus has done for you, your doing will flow effortlessly. Prince says, While success to the world comes by one's self-effort, willpower, and striving by one's own strength, God's way to supernatural effortless success is for you to depend totally on his unmerited favor. It's very interesting that many hypergrace teachers will talk about spirituality being effortless. The image would be of a tree. It doesn't make an effort to grow. It just drinks in the water and it grows naturally. Or a little child. The little child doesn't make an effort to grow. You don't sit there and stretch. You, you just eat and drink and sleep and, and you grow naturally. On the one hand, that's totally true, 100% true. It's what Psalm 1, uh, Psalm 1 speaks of, what John 15 speak of, the, the abiding in God. And as we abide in God, we just bear fruit naturally. And in that sense, it's effortless. On the flip side, it takes an effort to remain united with him. It takes an effort to meditate in the word day and night, recite, repeat, speak the word, get it in our heart and mind as as. Uh, Psalm 1 and John 15 speak of Jesus talking about his words abiding in us and us abiding in him. And throughout the New Testament, there are exhortations, be it Jesus telling us to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him. Be it Paul telling us in 1 Corinthians 9 to run our race so as to win and to discipline our bodies so that, so that we won't be disqualified. Or the image of Hebrews 12 of persevering in our race and encouraging us, hey, we haven't yet resisted sin to the point of shedding our blood and, and, and talking about the need to endure. In fact, that's a theme often repeated in Hebrews. You need to endure. You need to persevere. And, and spiritual warfare in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, this speaks of a wrestling. This speaks of, of a battle. Uh, there are many, many passages throughout the New Testament that speak of this. In fact, in my Hypergrace book, when I address the question of effortless spirituality, I first affirm where I agree and that we find rest in Jesus, that we, uh, we cease from our religious strivings and we do come to him and find rest for our souls, as he says in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. 
But then I interview Jesus, I interview Paul, I interview Peter, I interview other New Testament authors, and I say, is spirituality effortless? And I respond with verse after verse after verse after verse. Now, the reason this is so important is because many times when I've posted, say, on my Facebook page, on Ask Dr. Brown on Facebook, I'll post a verse about persevering or enduring or running our race or an exhortation from another Christian leader. People will be saying amen, and then someone, a hyper-grace adherent, will chime in, that's just religious works. That's just sin management. That's just behavior modification. I'm not into that, man. Spirituality is effortless. I'm thinking, why are they rejecting Scripture? Dead words, <laughs> law, old hags, stench, yeah. dirty fart smell in the room. I set you free today to retire from your own efforts, to no longer strive, climbing towards him. On the contrary, Jesus said, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The apostles also spoke about striving, willpower, and making every effort. I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Not that I have already attained this, that is, I have not already been perfected, but I strive to lay hold of that which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have attained this. Instead, I am single-minded, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching out for the things that are ahead. With this goal in mind, I strive toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Make every effort to present yourself before God as a proven worker who does not need to be ashamed, teaching the message of truth accurately. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of you guys know, I said this last night, that the gospel invalidates every ministry aimed at self-improvement. <laughs> that our efforts are not necessary for this drink. As a matter of fact, our efforts are the very thing that preclude us from this drink. <laughs> The very thing that alienate us from grace are the things that we try to attempt to help God out, to prop Him up. Oh, Jesus. You know, your efforts are not necessary. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Say, my efforts are not necessary. The whole gospel is about He does it for you. But it requires faith. And even He gives you faith. And finally, the hyper-grace accusation that we don't believe in repentance. Let me tell you, my friend, I believe in it far more than most folks. But true repentance is not the purchase price of salvation. Repentance is a fruit of salvation. If repentance is necessary to enter heaven, how much of it must we accumulate in order to make it in? I mean, how much is enough? 
stop snorting coke, stop picking up hookers. What if I just have one line of coke? What if I just have one hooker? Do I repent until I get a goose bump? Do I repent until I stop beating my wife? I mean, I mean what, how far do you go? Not only is this a big subjective rubber ruler, but dude, ultimately this is outright salvation by works. It's the preaching of the law. It's the idea of saving yourself that invalidates the work of the cross. It's, you, maybe you can preach it as good as John the Baptist and be the greatest in the old covenant, but you still, everybody in the new it is far greater than John because we're receiving his worth and his glory. And to invalidate the work of the cross by your own self-effort, my, my friend, that is absolutely anti-Christ in spirit. The Apostle Peter did not invalidate the work of the cross when he said, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. The condition of repentance for salvation is not a purchase price, as Crowder argues. The condition of repentance and obedience do not change the gift of grace into a wage. God does require self-effort from us, but the striving of a Christian is not entirely dependent upon self-effort because we are also enabled by God's Spirit and in cooperation with God's grace. For if you live according to the flesh you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. The word effortless is also used in the title of Benjamin Dunn's book, The Happy Gospel, Effortless Union with a Happy God. He writes, the only efforts necessary for this union with God were Christ's. Just simply respond with childlike wonder and amazement at the work of Christ. Just shout, yes, I believe it. John Crowder asks, Does happy, effortless Christianity sound scandalous to you? Does a daily walk of joyful, sinless existence seem like an impossibility? Moreover, Crowder says that real conversion effortlessly leads you to a happy, holy life. The repeated resistance to the fact that God requires us to make an effort can only lead to apathy. In the cases of Crowder and Dunn, effortless spirituality has led to utter foolishness and devilish mockery of the gospel. <laughs> And I think what this grace uh, teaching does, and I should say this hyper-grace teaching, it absolves the Christian from any sort of personal responsibility. You know, you don't have to pray, you don't have to fast, you don't have to, you know, do anything anymore. You just sit there like a bump on the log and, uh, you know, a great big funnel and God does everything for you, you know. Uh, I, I just don't get it. I mean, they're reading a totally different Bible than uh, the one I read and the, the one that, you know, all these people for centuries have read, you know, it's a brand new uh, form of, I hate to even call it Christianity, but a brand new type of religion that puts all the responsibility on, on God and absolves the Christian of any personal responsibility whatsoever. God's grace teaches us to say no to sin, to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Paul wrote, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works.
Joseph Prince says the moment you accepted Jesus, God gave you an eternal A plus for your right standing with him. In Pure Grace, Clark Whitten writes, You are like him, my friend, and are in a permanent and unchangeable state of holiness. When God looks at you, all he sees is the righteousness of Christ Jesus. The second chapter of Crowder's book, Mystical Union, is called Sanctification is Not a Process. Crowder says, The moment you decide to do something to be holy, you have trusted in yourself instead of Christ for salvation. You weren't, you didn't just die with him. This was not a partial death. Just to make sure he was fully dead, they ran the spear right up into his side and the blood and the way. You want to break your anointing? I'm going to break your anointing for you tonight. I'm going to break your bones for you. I'm going to come break your legs. Make sure you're dead. Oh, don't need to. You're dead. <laughs> not partially dead. Not on the road to killing yourself and sanctifying yourself. Sanctification is not a process, it is a person. Yeah. When you get that theology, the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he has become our sanctification. It means set apart. You are fully set apart. <laughs> All right, and sanctification isn't, it isn't a process, to be honest. It's not, we don't become more and more holy. No, we become holy once and for all. We become sanctified once and for all. Now the life we live is the overflow of what has happened. That miracle overflowing through our mind and through our body. Amen. In hyper grace teaching, the idea that sanctification is progressive is actually called a spiritually murderous lie. That's a direct quote from a prominent hypergrace teacher. The, the notion is you start from perfection, that the moment you are saved, you are completely and totally sanctified and made holy. Now, there's, there's a lot of language in Scripture, but you have been sanctified. For example, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, which talks about don't be deceived, the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, and then it lists various sins. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom. Then 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, and, and such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. So you have already been sanctified. That's part of it, but that's not the whole story. The moment we are saved, God sets us apart as holy, and he calls us holy ones. That's how we're addressed in the New Testament. Saints, that's what it means, holy ones. He sets us apart as holy, and now he calls us to live that out. 1 Thessalonians 4, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Live like this. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 having these promises of being children of God and God living among us, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness, completing sanctification in the fear of the Lord. So we are set apart as holy. Now we are called to live that out. So God dealing with us in space and time corrects us of our sins, uh, exhorts us not to displease him or grieve him, points out when we do something wrong. The whole New Testament deals with sin in the lives of believers. First Peter 1, we are called to be holy in all of our conduct because the way we live, the way we act things out is very important. Just saying I'm a holy one, just saying I'm sanctified is the beginning. Now as a holy one sanctified, I am to live out my sanctification. And then there's a final ultimate sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul prays for the complete sanctification of our spirit, soul, body. If we're already completely sanctified, we don't need to be prayed for to be completely sanctified. Hypergrace teachers will look at what Paul writes in Colossians 2, which says you're complete in Christ. And some translations would, would point to being perfect meaning that, that you are 100% perfect in God's sight because he sees you as a new creation through the blood of Jesus. So therefore, he'll never deal with you based on your sins. No matter what you do, you're still perfect in his sight. You can't grieve him or disappoint him or, or displease him because you're perfect. Let's just have Hebrews 10 up there. 
Um, okay, just, we'll just read verse 14 for the sake of time. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. Say for all time. Folks, how much is for all time? By one sacrifice, he has perfected forever all of those who are being sanctified. So let me close this question with this. When you come to Christ, you are perfected forever in the eyes of God. They'll point to Hebrews 10, which says that we have been perfected. But what that means there is, is, is through the sacrifice of Jesus brought into a place where we can rightly worship God. In fact, in that very same passage in Hebrews 10, he talks about our ongoing sanctification. So, so this is one of the big rubs. This is really, really one of the biggest issues. Christians have taught through the centuries that there are three parts of sanctification. That positionally, the moment we're saved, we are set apart as holy. Then progressively, as we grow and walk in the Lord, we grow in holiness and to the character of Jesus. And then the final, ultimate sanctification, when we are resurrected and made perfectly holy. According to hypergrace teachers, there is no progressive sanctification. And you just think, you're now preaching this. You're preaching, be holy. Well, I'm already holy. You're preaching, well, this is what God requires of you, your sanctification. I'm already sanctified. Well, let us complete our sanctification in the fear of God. I've already completed it. You can see how this can be a real trap. It's like salvation. You know, we're saved, we're being saved, and we will yet be saved, the Bible says. And so there's a big difference between salvation and conversion. Salvation is that all-inclusive uh, uh, moment, if you like, when we stand before God with our glorified body. You know, that, that's, that's our ultimate salvation. But we are converted. And the moment we are born again of the Spirit of God, we're regenerated. But, uh, but then there's a, a process towards maturity. You know, let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. You know. And, and all of that is up to you and I. God does not do it for us. My father used to say Christianity, in a sense, is like a do-it-yourself kit. God provides you with all the, all the pieces, but you have to put it together. You know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. God says, here it is, now you put it together. So there's an element in which, you know, if a man purge himself from these things, he shall be a vessel unto honor. You know, where there's a, a, a sort of a self-purging, if I can put it that way. Uh, where God enlightens me through the Word of God that this this particular thing is wrong or that particular thing and so on. I repent of it and then I, I move on. Um, but, uh, you know, this grace message absolves the, uh, the believer from any of that. And I, I, I can't see it. Lay aside, put on. I mean, you've got those... That phrase used many times in the scriptures. I've got to lay it aside. I've got to put it on. Put on the whole armor of God. God doesn't put it on for me. He provides it for me. God provides, but I have to apply it. You know, and so it's a, that application that is up to the uh, believer. We are warned that the process of sanctification cannot continue if a believer falls away or continues in sin. For those who repent and believe Christ, his single sacrifice is sufficient to present us to God, washing away our sins the moment we were saved. But there's more. If we reject this once-for-all sacrifice, if we decide that we can continue in willful, unrepentant sin, there is a fearful warning for us. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Stern warnings like this have been relegated by hyper-grace teachers. Obviously, if Christians were already completely sanctified, the apostles would not have to exhort them to live holy lives, which leads to sanctification. For example, the apostle John said, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Hypergrace teachers believe that Christians need to be delivered from trying to please God. John Crowder writes, It is high time the church gets delivered from God-pleasing. Likewise, Clark Witten writes, If you are working to please him, you are in for a lifetime of unfinished business, and it will leave you perpetually exhausted. According to Paul Ellis, there is nothing wrong with wanting to better yourself, but you have to understand that in Christ, 
you are already as good and pleasing to God as you ever will be. It is not true that Jesus pleased the Father so that we don't have to please Him. Too many scriptures say otherwise. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. Find out what pleases the Lord. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who tests our hearts. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Conversely, without such sacrifices God is displeased. And again, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. An ancient Israelite, when he sins, he brings his lamb to the priest in the tabernacle. And the priest does not examine the, the sinner. He examines his offering. He does not look at the offerer. It's obvious why he's there. He looks at the offering. Today, when you worship God, God is not looking at you. God is looking at your offering. God looks at the lamb and examines the lamb. Is the lamb good? Is the lamb without blemish? What do you reckon about our lamb? Is he good? Is he perfect? Is he without blemish? Is he altogether lovely? God accepts you in the offering that you bring. Joseph Prince wrote, Stop examining yourself and searching your heart for sin. Remember that when someone takes his sin offering to the priest, the priest does not examine him, he examines the sin offering. In contrast, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Paul Ellis says, But don't confuse behavior with identity. You are not defined by what you do. Your identity is Christ, and in Him you are and always will be 100% pleasing and acceptable to God. As for seeing Christians perfect... 100% pleasing and acceptable to God, no matter what they do. Nothing could be further from the truth. Consider what Jesus spoke to the churches in the book of Revelation. Out of the seven churches, it was only the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia that God found to be perfect, 100% pleasing and acceptable. The five other churches, made up of individual believers, were strongly rebuked by Jesus. He sees you in Christ Jesus. He sees you in your older brother. When he looks at you, he just sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. He does not see your faults. He does not see your mistakes. Well, first of all, if he's a real genuine uh, believer, he doesn't have any sin, or he shouldn't have. Uh, but if he does sin, obviously God sees it. He saw the sins of the five of the seven churches of Revelation, drew their attention to it. Uh, you know, God doesn't wear rose-colored glasses and, uh, and uh, sort of see everything through the blood of Jesus. No, he sees us as we are. Uh, the reason he disciplines us is, uh, is uh, because he sees things that uh, need to be chastened. Every son he receives, he disciplines. And, uh, and so obviously he, he sees our condition. He brings that out. Paul saw the condition of the, uh, the man that was living with his father's wife, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, and said, uh, you know, it needs to be dealt with. He says, you've not mourned, you've not grieved, and so on. Then when he writes to 2 Corinthians, he, he brings him the point. He says, you know, you, you've got godly sorrow. You've sort of finally woken up, and, and it's brought you to repentance. And so again, there is a, another case of repentance for the believer. And uh, so, yeah, God sees us. Uh, Paul certainly saw the condition of the church. He said, you know, uh, you're babes, you're carnal. Uh, he pointed out, and the, the Word of God points out. Now, it's not, a, it's not for condemnation. It's so that uh, God can deal with the situation. It's like going to a doctor 
and the doctor says, listen, you've got, uh, you've got this disease or whatever it is, we need to operate. Yet John Crowder says, whenever someone is saved, the battle against sin is decisively over. He also writes, we are not climbing an unseen ladder. We have already arrived. The only thing that differentiates you from a Muslim, from a Buddhist, from a Hindu, is that you can boast of the fact that you already arrived. But the Apostle Paul wrote, Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Holiness is not about doing this or not doing that about your clothing or the, your hairstyle or whatever it is. It's not about your behavior. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's all about being occupied with the lovely one, Jesus. The commandments of Christ and his apostles are an important part of the gospel of the grace of God. In the gospel of John we read, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus epitomized grace and truth. Even though Jesus did not come to perpetuate the law of Moses, this doesn't mean that Jesus had no law. Jesus' commands and his eternal law are not opposed to grace. Jesus and the apostles referred to the old covenant law of Moses in the following terms, until John the Baptist, obsolete, growing old, ready to vanish away, is passing away, abolished. While the law of Moses was the inspired word of God in the Old Testament, its civil and ceremonial ordinances are not imposed upon Christians in the New Testament. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, Peter the Apostle said, Now therefore why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we should be saved in the same manner as they. When the Apostles say things like, You are not under law but under grace, and the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, they are contrasting the old covenant law of Moses with the New Testament. In those passages, grace is being used as a synonym for the New Covenant, primarily because the forgiveness of sins is a major theme throughout the New Testament. But that is not to say that the New Covenant has no law. A very common sentiment today is the notion that, look, I'm free, I have liberty in Christ Jesus, I don't have to you know, worry about what I do and how I do it, I don't need to dot I's, cross T's, that's legalism. And, you know, I'm not a fan of legalism any more than anyone else would be. However, what we see is this concept, this marring of a concept of being free or having liberty in Christ Jesus. You see, we're a slave. We're a slave unto sin in our Adam condition. However, there is one that has come. He's known as the last Adam. And he has accomplished something that actually, it, when we turn to Jesus Christ and believe, there's a new law in effect. The law of sin and death, sin you die, has been trumped by a higher law, the law of believe and live. And so when we believe in Jesus Christ, we have life. And when we have life, we are free from our old Adam state called the flesh. We're no longer ruled by our carnal or baser instincts, but we are now ruled by a higher life. We are ruled by our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. So what are we free from? Are we free from God? No. We're free from our old lusts and behaviors so that we can now live unto God and be a slave unto righteousness. Before we were a slave unto sin, but now we can be a slave unto righteousness. And some people are like, I don't want that. I want to be free from God. Well, that's not Christianity. If you want life and life abundant, 
you give your life unto Jesus Christ. You see, you're going to be a slave one, one way or the other. You're either going to be a slave unto sin and remain on that throne of your life and die. You sin, you die. Or you believe and you live. But when you believe and you live, what you're doing is you're giving up your life as you now know it. You're coming to that cross. You're dying so that Christ can now live. It's old man and new man. That old life is crucified. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. My old man was crucified in Christ Jesus. This is a fact. But then when you turn to Jesus, you have newness of life. It's not just that your old life dies and now you're in control and you're free from that old life and you're free from God too and you just live your own way. No, you're free from the old man so that a new man can take the reins and you are now ruled by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have a King of kings and a Lord of lords that masters you. That's good news. It's not bad news. If we're in control of our own life, we die. We need to be controlled by God. In general, hyper-grace teachers have created a false dichotomy between a grace-filled relationship with God and a commandment-keeping faith relationship with God. The truth is that a saving relationship with God is characterized by obedient faith enabled by His grace. Steve McVeigh claims, whether we see people as living morally or immorally, we're viewing life through a lens we aren't intended to use. God hasn't designed life to be lived based on a system of morality. He has a much better plan in mind for us than that. Paul Ellis writes, A counterfeit gospel will imprison you within the confining walls of rules and regulations, but the true gospel proclaims, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The New Testament is very clear that a new covenant has been inaugurated with the people of God. It's to Israel and Judah, and then by extension to all those who believe in the Jewish Messiah. And this new covenant is not like the Sinai covenant. That was a covenant even though the laws were good and perfect. Paul says in Romans 7, the law is holy and just and good. Read Psalm 19. Read Psalm 119. The law is something praised, and God is, is to be thanked for his wonderful commandments and statutes, but it was written on stone, not on our hearts. So the law is over here telling me, Mike Brown, don't commit adultery. Mike Brown, don't worship idols. Mike Brown, don't steal. And I and myself fall short. As, as a fallen human being. And that now condemns me. And, and that's why Israel suffered the way it did in the Old Testament scriptures, because it was constantly falling short. That's why God said he would make a new and better covenant, one where he would put his law on our hearts. So Paul says in Romans 6, as he's exhorting us and encouraging us to die to sin and live to God, he says, you're not under law, you're under grace. Now, by the way, he, he, he is telling us that to encourage us to live a holy life. He's telling us that to help us live an overcoming life. However, the hyper-grace camp often reacts against commandments themselves, laws themselves. One hyper-grace teacher said if God wrote the law, the Ten Commandments on our hearts, it would kill us. No! It, if he writes his law on a new heart that's been redeemed by Jesus, it's now our nature to do it. That's why the New Testament is filled with commandments. In 1 Thessalonians 4, when, when Paul's exhorting the Thessalonians there, he, he uses the word for exhortation, which is basically a commandment word. This is what we commanded you. And, and that's why Paul can freely quote from the Ten Commandments in Ephesians 6. And he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Paul quotes from the Ten Commandments and gives it to the Ephesians as such. So, in point of fact, the law is good in and of itself. We are bad. That's the problem. So, God made a new and better covenant where he changes us from the inside out and puts his laws on our heart. So, that means we can read all of the word and be enriched by it, be changed by it, helped by it, edified by it, learn about the holiness of God through it but not be under that system of law as a system of justification. Legalism is bad in itself. Law is not bad in itself. And sometimes hyper-grace teachers make that, that uh, failure to distinguish. And they think that somehow law in itself is bad. Law brings wrath because of the sinfulness 